This is a demonstration of the recently completed memory unit, which forms part of my Relay computer. As you can see, it consists of two cards, the upper one on the left and the lower one on the right. The two cards connect together, with the upper card on top and the lower card on the bottom, to form the memory unit. The lower card is the first to make use of integrated circuits, also known as ICs, or just chips. Now you may be wondering what ICs are doing in a Relay computer, and it's a fair question. And to be honest, it's a bit of a cop-out. You see, it's a problem of space. If I was to make memory out of relays, which is entirely possible, I mean each of the registers is effectively an 8-bit piece of memory, yes, if I was to do that, uh, there wouldn't be much room in the house for me, or any of my possessions, or anything else for that matter. So good old compact integrated circuits it is. Now I'm going to do this in a bit more detail on my blog, relaycomputer.blogspot.co.uk, if you want to know more about why I chose this way of doing memory. Anyhow, let's flip the cards over. Now as mentioned in my previous video, I've now switched to just using bare wire for the majority of the ground lines. You can see those on the right hand card running across horizontally. You can also see on the left hand card the grey ground wires and the red 12 volt wires. What you won't have seen before though is the yellow wire on the right hand card, and that's carrying 5 volts. And that's there because that's what the memory chip runs on, 5 volts. And that's what complicates this card, because we've got to convert the 12 volts coming in for the rest of the computer to the 5 volts that the chip needs. OK, so if we pop back to the front of the cards, and if we concentrate now on the LEDs down at the front. Then for the lower card, these show the status of the address bus and data bus. Now both these buses are local to the memory chip, and when in use, each line is either 5 volts or ground. Both buses are interfaced with the rest of the computer on the upper card. Now I need to admit of a bit of a mistake here, because on this card I forgot that the LEDs were using 5 volts, and actually I've used 12 volt rated LEDs, so consequently all these LEDs will be a lot dimmer than the LEDs in the rest of the computer. But I'd already sold them down, so it's all too late. Hey ho! Right then, moving on to the upper card. And as you can see, there's four LEDs on the left and a switch on the right. The switch stops the memory card from writing a value onto the data bus, and sometimes that's useful when you want to debug the computer. The four LEDs on the left show what's currently being done with the memory. Starting at the right, we have bus to memory, and that's lit when the current value of the data bus is being gated onto the memory data bus. And while that's being gated, if the right LED is lit, the WR LED, that means the value that's on that memory data bus is being stored in the memory at the location specified by the address bus. So in practice, these two LEDs come on at the same time. Next up is read, the RD LED. And this is lit when we're reading the value out of the memory onto the data bus, again from the location specified by the address bus. Finally then on the left is the enable LED, EN, and that's connected directly to the memory enable switch to show whether it's on or off. Right, that's it for the LEDs and the switch at the front. Let's go back over to that other card and take a look at those ICs. First of all, we have the heart of the memory unit, the memory chip itself. Now this can store 32,768 unique 8-bit values. And in theory, that should be more than this computer would ever need. And really here, I'm just being guided by the availability of this chip. It's very common, very easy to get hold of, and if you excuse the term, it's cheap as chips. Sorry. Here's the address bus lines going into the chip, and here are the data bus lines that carry the values in and out of the chip. To the top right is the memory enable relay. Now only the first 15 bits of the address bus are actually used by the memory chip, and that's because that's enough to reference the 32,768 memory slots that the chip contains. The final bit therefore is used to enable or disable the chip so that it doesn't interfere if we're addressing higher memory locations. Eventually those higher memory locations will be used by other cards, possibly displays or maybe some other things. Either way it allows us some room for future expansion. The final chip on this card is the relay driver. 
and that's used to drive, funnily enough, the relays on the upper card. Now this works in a slightly odd way, so this is connected to the data bus coming out of the memory chip. And for each line of that data bus that's switched on, the relay driver will sync current on the other side of that chip. Effectively then, it works kind of like an inverter, or a logical knot. But it's absolutely essential for that little memory chip running at 5 volts to be able to switch such a large device like a relay running at 12 volts. And that's pretty much it for the lower card. We now just need to transfer all those lines to the upper card. And this is done using the intercard connects and these are very similar to the ones we've seen before on the sequencer and controller. Firstly, there's three power connects at the bottom right. There's 12 volts, 5 volts, and in the middle, the 5 volt ground. Over at the far left is where the address bus comes in over two columns of connectors. Next up is the outbound data bus, which comes off of the relay driver. And as mentioned earlier, this sinks to ground for a 1 value and is held high for a 0 value. Next up is the inbound data bus, which connects directly to the memory chip. And just as with the address bus, each line must be connected to 5 volts or to ground. Finally at the top is the write enable and output enable lines. Now each of these has a little hash mark in front of them, and that's to signify that these work in the opposite way you'd expect. That is, you ground them to activate them, as opposed to connecting them to 5 volts. So, as we mentioned, these interconnects take these signals to the upper card. And it's from here where we do a bit of conversion to get it talking to the rest of the computer. Now we can divide all these relays into four basic groups. Starting at the bottom, we have the data bus to memory. Now given any particular line of the data bus, it's either connected to 12 volts or it isn't. Now that's no good for the memory chip, so here we convert a connected 12 volts to a 5 volts, and a disconnected 12 volts to a 5 volt ground. Each of those converter values then goes through a set of gating relays before going off to the memory chip on the lower card. In the next group, we handle the data bus coming back out of the memory chip. Again, this goes through a set of gating relays first, before heading off to the negative side of each relay coil. The positive side of each relay coil goes off to that memory enable switch at the bottom left of this picture. This way, when a line is being synced by the relay driver, it'll switch that particular relay on. And with the relay switched on, it'll connect that particular line of the data bus to 12 volts, thereby powering it to the rest of the computer. The next group handles the address bus coming in, and the conversion here is very similar to the data bus to memory seen at the bottom. Now no gating relays are required here, because the address bus is always connected to the memory chip. The last two relays handle the read and write control, and mainly these are concerned with getting the right voltage again, but also making sure you can't read from the memory the same time you're writing to it. Right, nearly there. Let's have a look at those connectors, and then we're done. These are the first cards to use the Type Y connector. If we start at the left, we have the address bus. This is followed by the Control Y bus. Then the Data Control bus. And finally the Power connector. Let's head off to the other card, where we find the exact same connectors in the exact same order because also it's a type Y card. Just before we leave this part of the card though, probably just worth noticing the black block in the top right hand corner. Yep, that one there. And that's a DC to DC converter which takes 12 volts down to 5. Right, so that all took quite a lot longer than I was hoping for, but it is a complex pair of cards. Anyway, let's give the thing a test. And I'll start by flicking each bit of the address bus on, one bit at a time. And you can see the corresponding LED lighting up on the memory address bus. And that's all as expected, because it's permanently connected to the address bus coming in off the computer. Notice there that I've skipped the last bit, because that's not used on this memory chip. Effectively, only 15 bits are needed for the address bus. And that's enough then to address the 32,768 memory locations. OK, right, before I move on, I'm just going to move these connectors over for the address bus. So effectively, the bottom four bits are going over to this switch here. We'll get rid of these ones, and then move the last eight bits 
over to the middle set of switches. That'll free up the left hand set of dip switches, which we'll use in a minute. I'll now just flip a couple of these switches over just so you can see the effect on the address bus. OK, right, so I'll bring over the data bus connector now and bring that over to the switches on the left. And to start with, I'll set a simple on off pattern. And notice nothing appears on the memory data bus until we gate it onto it. And that gating is necessary, of course, because we can read a value from memory or we can write to it, but we mustn't do both at the same time. OK, so now let's try storing a value into the memory. In this case, it's all bit set into location 0. I'll now switch to address bus location 1 and take the last bit off the address bus. I'll now fill three more memory locations as shown on screen. Right, OK, so with those values loaded into memory, I move the data bus connector back over to the LED bar display. And with that in place, I should be able to read the values back out of memory onto the data bus. If I go back to memory location 0, which contains all bits of the data bus set on, I can show the effect of enabling and disabling the output. And that comes in handy sometimes when you're debugging the computer. I can now also show the effect of setting the last bit of the address bus. As you can see, it just disables the memory completely. Something I want to show now is what happens when you select values from memory that's not been initialised. As you can see, any location in memory that's not specifically set to something could contain anything. Right, that's enough of that. Let's get the memory unit into the computer. And I can start with a similar test to what we did with the cards outside of the computer by loading values onto the address bus. Let's load that value into the program counter. I can now clear down the main switches and drive the memory unit from the program counter. And with that available in the program counter, let's load a different value onto the switches. Now the next bit is going to take some dexterity. So we'll start with selecting the data bus, combine that with busing that to the memory, and finish the combo with writing it to the memory. We can now read that value back. And just to prove I'm not cheating, note however though that was all at memory location 0. If I want to bring the program counter in, then it's a four fingered operation. And it's two fingers to read it back off again. Right, well it looks like that's all working as it should do, so let's try a small program.
So effectively here, I'm loading the program counter, then entering the instruction, and then loading that into memory. I can now continue that on through the last two lines of the program. Right, that's done. Let's check it. So let's push the first value from memory into the instruction register, prime the sequencer, and then clock it through. OK, that's put 2 into register B. Let's load the next instruction. And run that through. OK, that's 4 into register A. And that's copied the value in register A to register C. Final run. And that's the value we wanted in register A of 6. Once the increment is complete, I won't need to hang crank the program counter. And I can show that in my next video. But for now, as far as the memory unit is concerned, that's pretty much it. As always, more information can be found at relaycomputer.blogspot.co.uk and feel free to like, comment and subscribe and I'll see you next time.